Welcome to the first session of the Discipleship Series by Zeal Movement, and we're going to talk today about God's big story. We're going to do a lot of overview, a little bit of review, um, and just give you an understanding about the picture that God gives us from Genesis to Revelation. And before we do, we'd like to start with a word of prayer. So, Craig, would you sure, open us? Sure, of course. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and direct our words. Uh, you've promised Jesus that uh, he would give us the words to say in the time that we need it. And so we trust you, and we ask that this would be a blessing to you and many who hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, thank you. I'm really grateful to be here today to have this conversation because um, as we were preparing, I realized that there was kind of a question in my mind we know that the Bible starts with in the beginning, but what about the in the beginning God? We know that he was here. Why did he do all of what he did after that scripture in the beginning? So would you share that with us, Craig? Sure. As I was, uh, I was assigned the topic of the church and its birth and what have you, and we'll, you'll hear about that in another session. But as I was asking before the Lord, I said, Lord, why? Why the church? And what I, I, I realized was that we often start in the wrong place. We assume that the beginning is Genesis chapter 1. But in fact, God is eternal. He dwells outside of time. And so we just had to say, well, what was going on in God's heart and in his mind at the time? And he is the great I am. He dwells outside of time. And time is a construct. As a matter of fact, listen to this scripture from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 15. That which has been already and that which will be has already been. For God seeks what has passed by. I used to scratch my head every time I read that scripture saying, what in the world is Solomon talking about? But if you know that God dwells outside of time, he sees the beginning from the end. He already knows what's going to end up happening at the end. And so, why did God decide to create man? Genesis chapter 1. The father wanted a vast family of sons. And when I say the term sons, I mean women and men, not just uh, men. He wanted a vast family of sons with whom he could share the joys of uh, what was being experienced by the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy, Spirit's, the Holy Spirit. They all existed from before creation, and they had a relationship that was full of love and joy, and they, they wanted, love is, needs to be shared. And so f the Father decided that he was going to create man. And so, what we see is that uh, he created man uh, in Genesis chapter 1, and it says, actually, we, let us create man in our image and in our likeness. And so, there was, unlike all of the other creation, God decided to make man to look like and be like uh, and have the ability to communicate with him uh, as the three, God, the three in the Godhead did. And... He, he gave him authority, he gave him dominion over all of the creation. And as a matter of fact, on the day that man was created, he put an exclamation point next to it. He basically said, this is very good, or exceedingly good. So when he created man, that day was a very exciting for God. And he, uh, no other creation had that said about them. And at the end of the day, he basically breathed in him the breath of life. He came and became a living soul, which could now have fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So he, he was able to, uh, one point I want to make is that God is love. The scriptures are clear about that. Well, what is love? Love is uh, basically always focused on the other. It's always giving. But love has to be a voluntary act. Mm. Because if, it's, if you're compelled yeah. uh, to love, it's not love at all. 
as a matter of fact, uh, in the scriptures, I think it's in uh, Song of Solomon, it says, if a man were to give all that he possesses for, for love, it would be utterly despised. In other words, if I had to buy love, it's not love at all. And so, he had to give man a, a free will, the ability to choose. Mm -hmm. And so he, he, and that's a, a actual blessing to man. But he was taking a risk when he did that, mm -hmm. because man could decide he was going to go his own way. And so love took a risk, and he was given the ability to choose, and God placed, among other things, two trees in the garden. Mm -hmm. One was the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil, and the other was the tree of life. And man, in his own enticement, chose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which would enable him to live separate from God. And the father told him, don't eat of this thing, because if you do, you will die in that day. Now, we know, of course, uh, Adam, we know the rest of that story. Adam ate of the fruit along with his wife Eve, and they died, but they were still alive. Hmm. They died spiritually. So they could no longer have communion and fellowship with the Father. And so they chose door number two, and they forfeited their ability to have communion with God. And so, but the Father, interestingly enough, did not say oops when that happened. <laughs> he had a plan. As, uh, and as uh, I would like to then turn it over to Christina, who will go through God's overarching picture the plan of God throughout the ages. Thanks, Craig. I really appreciate um, your way of just describing that and explaining it because, again, it says in the beginning God, but what did he do and why? And I'm so um, really just looking for those answers. And when you shared your speech or your talk with us uh, several weeks ago, that puzzle piece for me was put in place, and I felt it was really important to share before we go through God's big story. So, if you've happened upon this session, if somebody's sharing it with you, or if maybe you came upon it by accident, which we know isn't an accident, um, I'd like to talk about why why the Bible's even here, what does it tell us, and what are we supposed to glean from it? Um, God's rulership over His kingdom is where all things are under God's authority. So when the Bible says, in the beginning, God, if there is an entity that can literally speak the universe into being, how powerful is he? Very powerful. And definitely with the authority to say, this is my realm, this is my dominion. And to then give that authority to those that he created. Um, but he also, as you talked about love, wanted to be in relationship with us. and. We know that something went wrong. Craig alluded to that. So what happened? How did we get where we are now? So I'm just going to read the, the scripture that we've referenced so many times. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And, and, and the whole chapter goes on to describe the way that God spoke and things came into being. So there was a beginning and God did establish his kingdom. Um, additional verses that, that reference that are Isaiah 45, 18, for this is what the Lord says, he who created the heavens, he is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. And that was us. He That's formed exciting. it on purpose to be inhabited with us. I find that really exciting. I, that gives me purpose. That means that I'm not here by accident, that God has something very intentional for me to do in this time and space. And that should motivate me to search that out, to figure out what that is and not waste my time here. Um, he goes on to say, um, I am the Lord and there is no other. So when we're searching for that, we're going to find things that are counterfeits. But this scripture says, no, I am the Lord, there is no other. Hebrews 11.3 says, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. God did all of this. And, and for so many years growing up in the church, I didn't understand that puzzle piece that you shared with us. Mm -hmm. But he did it because he loves us. He wanted to be in community with us. He wanted a relationship with us. 
And we just have to be willing to accept that fact. That's not always easy as humans, I would say. <laughs> um, and then, as Craig mentioned, sin came into the world. Man fell. Man made a bad choice. And what is sin? It's really just the breaking of God's law. Anything that grieves God's heart, um, something that goes against his nature, his character, because we know that he cannot go against his character. And so when we do things that grieve his heart, that's sin, and it does separate us from him. Um, it, it affects relationships. It affects the relationship that we have the potential to have with him. Um, when Adam and Eve sinned, God came to the garden and they were hiding because they knew that they had done something to break the relationship that they previously enjoyed. Um, when we sin, it's a barrier between God and us, and it creates difficulties between men and women. That's in Genesis 3. It creates difficulties between gods and humans and humans and his creation. So it's something that breaks down the original intention of what he created us to have and to be. And so what did he do as soon as we broke that? I love this part. <laughs> he immediately set in place his rescue plan. And so even in the curses that he set forth, to Adam and Eve and to Satan, he talks about what would come, and that would be his son. And his son would come from the seed of the woman, and his son would crush the serpent's head. And that is encouraging to me, because even in this story of what God did for us that was good and what we did to ruin it, he said, nope, I have a way, and I'm putting it in place because I love you. And that really encourages me. So we have hope in the midst of loss. It's a beautiful thing. And I think in this world, you can see, right? There's a lot of hopelessness. There's people just wandering about, looking for a reason to live, looking for a reason to exist, ultimately sometimes saying there isn't one, and then going to drastic measures based upon incorrect feelings, right? Mm -hmm. And if they only understood, if you only understood, God put you here in this time and place for a reason, for a purpose that only you can accomplish for Him. And He wants to be in relationship with you, but like Craig mentioned, He's not going to force it. He's a very respectful God, and He gives us the ability to choose Him, and He wants us to, but He waits. Um, so really, in Scripture, beyond that, we see this thread, like weaving of a tapestry, and there are three themes, I think, that you can look for as you read scripture and look to search. You're searching for where you see God, where you see his character. Um, there's three themes that will help to frame what you're looking for as you read scripture. And the first one is God's faithfulness. He is faithful. He does not go back on his word. He does not break promises. We can all think of times when we've done that or people in our lives have done that. God does not do that. He cannot go against his character. He is good. He is faithful. And he will do what he says he will do. And so we can rely on that. When God says something, he means it, and he will not go back on his word. And that, I think, is really an essential thing to look for in Scripture. The second thing to look for in Scripture is man's sin and rebellion. You don't only see it in Genesis 3. That is a theme woven in that tapestry throughout Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, that we mess up. The Israelites got into a pattern of sin and repentance and then sin and repentance, and, and God was there through all of that. He did not leave his people. He did not leave his people. He said, you are my people, and I want you. And he called them back, and sometimes they listened, and sometimes they didn't. And again, he's just. He's also just. He's merciful. He doesn't go against his word. And so um, when we find ourselves in that space or when we're reading in Scripture, God's faithfulness is there. Man's sin and rebellion is there. But then a third one, and it brings me back to the theme of hope, um, God's rescue plan. And he put that in place in the very beginning. And he, again, wove that through the tapestry of Scripture. You will see that theme throughout where you can see what he had done and what he was going to do. And some of the big stories that we know and understand from Scripture illustrate that beautifully. Um, Noah and the flood. Noah built a boat for a hundred years 
when there was no rain. People were making fun of him. He was the only righteous man on the earth. I feel encouraged that I'm not in that position. When, when it's hard, when you feel beat down, I do often tell my kids, but, but Noah, he only had himself and his family. I have friends. I have a church family. I have people that are surrounding me that I can call to in times of discouragement. Noah only had God, which was enough, absolutely enough. Um, but 100 years is a long time to build a boat when there was no rain, <laughs> right? I mean, that's a long time. So um, God made a covenant after the rain, after the boat landed, and he said, this rainbow is a sign that I will never flood the entire earth again. God has kept that promise, and he will, because he is a promise keeper. Um, the story moves along. You see the Tower of Babel. There are many, many nations that inhabit the earth, and God scatters them. He says, this is not good. You're trying to reach heaven. You're trying to become like me in an unhealthy way, and I'm going to scatter the nations. And we see how God put people in different places on the earth and continued to build um, peoples that had the ability to choose him. Um, he calls Abraham because he decides he wants a people set apart to know him and to love him. And he calls Abraham and he promises Abraham that he would make him the father of nations. Abraham had one son. And that would be the beginning of how God did that. Abraham did not see the fruition of that promise, but we know from history that God fulfilled that promise and that Abraham was the father of many nations. Um, Isaac and his sons, Jacob and Esau, Jacob would be, become the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, it goes further to talk about Joseph. Joseph is taken into Egypt and he becomes a slave and it looks dire, right? But no, God had a plan and purpose in that. Mm -hmm. God's people came. Jacob brings his family. There's restoration with his brothers. It's a great story if you haven't read it. Um, people sometimes say, this is a side note, but people sometimes say the Bible's not very exciting. I don't know any movie that covers all the things that are in the Bible. You should really take time to sit down with it and explore. It's a great an amazing story, not just in the storyline, but because it's true, because it's the history of what God gave to us, and it's uh, His revelation to us. So in all of the stories, you see God's faithfulness, you see sin and rebellion, you see God's rescue plan, and many other themes that I don't have time to go into today. But Joseph, um, God delivers his people from Egypt after 400 years in slavery, and God comes and he says, let my people go. And Pharaoh he does that sin and rebellion thing, and God uses that for his purpose. His people are led into the desert, and there are miracles, and there are amazing things that he does, and then his people rebel, and they are disciplined by time away, a time out, yeah, a long time, time out. out in the desert. <laughs> um, <laughs> he gives them the Ten Commandments. He says, these are the ways that I want you to live. Um, and there are just beautiful things that he does all throughout that story. We don't have time to go into it today, but I just would encourage you to really take the opportunity to explore scripture, to dig into it. There are going to be things you don't understand. There are things I don't understand. But when you take the time to know God, to get into his word, which is his special revelation to us, it's how it's how in one way he helps us to know him. Another way is through prayer um, in in more sessions of this program you're going to learn about daily living with him um, different things that you can do to get him get to know him better but scripture is one of the primary ways that we know who god is and he reveals himself to us um, and we get to one of my favorite parts we just celebrated christmas and we get to where jesus is given to us on earth and god sent his son in the form of a baby so that he could grow up to be a man, be tempted like we are, walk this earth, give us opportunities to see the power of God in, in a person, do miracles, and really just spread that hope that his people had been waiting for for so long. And truthfully today, if you don't know him, you're waiting for that hope too. And he's here. And that's the beauty of where the story goes. Um, he has come. He has 
given his life. He died on the cross to pay for that sin and rebellion that you and I both experience. And he rose from the dead, which is really the most important part of the story because if he stayed dead, we would be worshiping nothing. Yeah. There would be nothing. But he's alive and he wants to be in relationship with you. And that's where the story takes us. And then we're in this place of the church. We've read through the New Testament. We see that God has given us um, communities to be in. He instructs us, do not give up meeting together because being in community with other like-minded people is essential for encouragement, um, teaching, even rebuking. We should be able to be accountable to one another and be in community. Um, but the story doesn't even end there. You get into Revelation and there's hope of the kingdom being restored. And so I'd just like to read to you Revelation 19, 11 through uh, 16, where Jesus comes back and claims his church. It's just a beautiful thing. And again, we're waiting for that to happen, but we know because God's a promise keeper that it will. And when that time comes, it's going to be amazing. It says, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and his mouth comes, out of his mouth comes, a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So Jesus comes back to claim his kingdom, to rule with all the authority that he's had all along in the timing that God says is appropriate. And we get to be a part of that. I find that really exciting. I find that hope giving. I find that um, it encourages me in times when I'm frustrated. Just knowing the truth of the word um, gives me purpose and hope and a place to put my trust and faith in. And um, I've said this in other spaces and times and people that know me, it's like the thing that I preach. The way that you think determines the way you feel and the way that you act. If your life is based in a lie, you're going to think according to lies and you're going to feel according to lies and then you're going to act according to lies. And that sounds awful, but sometimes we don't accurately describe the way we're living and we're deceived. Satan is the deceiver. Um, but this word is true. This word comes from God and what it says you can put your faith in. And so rather than seeing God's plan for my life in those pages, I want you to realize that this story was written and you should see where your life fits into that plan and know that that's a truth, that's a reality, that when you sit back and think, um, no, nobody wants me, not true, God wants you, he made you on purpose. When you sit back and think, um, I don't have a place in this world, that's another lie, it's not true. God's word is true and it says that he created you to be in relationship with him, that he loves you already and he wants you to love him back, that there is freedom in that relationship and that his word can be trusted. And again, the God that is powerful enough to speak the universe into being is powerful enough to make any changes that need to be made in your life. He is powerful enough to speak truth to me. I can hear his voice when I'm in relationship with him and this word is where you're going to find that. So in closing, we were made to know him. We were made to love him. We were made to be loved by him and called according to his purposes. And another piece of that is to tell others of the freedom that we have received, which is why we're here today. Because God's word is true. We want you to know it. We want you to live according to that. And we want you to be encouraged today that no matter where you're at, changing your thinking to being understanding of truth, which is God's word, is what will be the beginning of setting you free. 
So I thank you for your time today. I thank you, Craig, for being here with me. I'm just okay. going to close us in a word of prayer. Okay. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your character that never changes. I thank you for every person that will see this message and be a part of this process. I thank you that you have put each of us here on this earth on purpose, that you have a plan, that we fit into your story, and that means that we have a place, that we are not an accident, that you knew us from the beginning of time. You loved us then and you love us now. And I just ask for your wisdom and guidance in discovering that, that if somebody has a relationship with you already, that you would just take them to the next level. That if somebody doesn't know you yet, that you would reach out to touch their heart, that they would um, accept the truth of the things that we said today. We thank you so much for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.